Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. Brian Barron, Director of Skincare Research for Paula's Choice Skincare for our um, last live chat of January 2022. Today's topic is going to be about how to treat dry skin. So I'm going to be discussing a few different uh, offshoots of that. We'll of course be discussing the, the what's referred to in the literature as the etiology or the causes of dry skin. And there are many, including some that fall into the medical field, which you'll need to discuss with your physician, whether it's your primary care provider or your dermatologist. There are some that are due to uh, nutritional deficiencies. More often than not, dry skin is multifactorial, and sometimes it can have everything to do with the product you're using. So even though you think you're taking great care of your skin, if you're not really clued into what's in the products and then how that how those ingredients are impacting your skin, that could be another hidden culprit. So we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about the difference between dry skin and dehydrated skin and, and then how to tell which one you're dealing with. We're going to talk about how to deal with flaky skin, and we're also going to talk about, uh, and that the flaky skin uh, question is going to cover flaky skin anywhere on the body. Uh, I see that we already have a question about flaky skin on the feet, so we'll get to that. Um, I've got my Azo refreshment tea. Tazo, it's Tazo. I always say Azo, and there is a tea there. Um, lovely, lovely tea, caffeine-free, so I can drink it later in the day. Um, Mint tarragon is delicious. Anyway, um, we're also going to be talking about what to do or how to handle your skin when it is dry, like truly, truly dry, not dried out because of irritating ingredients, but just dry skin and acne. Probably the most frustrating combination of concerns because pretty much anything that you could use that's labeled for dry skin has a moderate to high risk of making acne breakouts worse. So what do you do? How do you, how do you successfully address both concerns? Um, oh, and a quick side note, because I have a, a couple of show and tells here. Um, there's been this discussion board going on uh, at, at work. You know, we have our little offshoot chats, um, which is kind of a decent replacement, you know, for those uh, lunchroom conversations you have in an office setting where you just kind of have that five, ten minutes where you're talking to a coworker about anything other than skincare, right? Or whatever your industry is. Um, and mind you, for most of us, it's very difficult to get us to stop talking about skincare, but we manage. And um, so there's been this discussion board going about hair care products that people really like. And I've, uh, I saw so many of my colleagues um, profess to loving the hair care, hair care brand, I'll get that out, Living Proof. And so I decided to try a couple of their products um, and mm, you think my hair looks good today? If you're like, you know, his hair looks a little bit better today than it usually does. <laughs> it's living proof. I have been using, I've been using the full shampoo, which is their, um, shampoo for body and vol volume, which I definitely need. I have normal to, uh, fine hair. Um, I don't, I don't have as much hair as I did 10 years ago, but I'm trying to hold on to all that I can. And uh, for styling, I decided to try the Living Proof PhD. This product right here, it's uh, Perfect Hair Day is what PhD stands for. Um, I thought the um, acronym there was, was cute because for those of you not familiar with the Living Proof hair care brand, uh, they were started, uh, you, they were, there's a hair care brand that was built around uh, polymer technology, as I understand it, that was developed at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, very prestigious uh, school here in the United States. So um, this is their 5-in-1 styling treatment, and one of the things I love about this product is that it, it can be the only styling product that I need. So I put it on when my hair is damp after I use my Living Proof shampoo. Um, I do need to get a conditioner, admittedly, um, I just get really lazy about conditioning my hair. And in fact, I don't think we have a conditioner in the house right now. So if you use Living Proof and you've tried one of their conditioners, leave a comment for me because I need to figure out which one to buy. Um, 
But I love, oh no, my little glasses piece came off. <sighs> That's going to suck for later. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can fix this, you guys. Bear with me. All right, so what I was saying, is that slide in? Or is it going like this? Should I wear it without the nose piece? Am I just screwed? Stay tuned. Ah, all right, well, we'll deal with this later. What I love about the 5-in-1 styling treatment is that it can be the only styling product I use. I put it in damp hair, comb it through, blow my hair dry, and then I'll add um, a pea-sized dab more when my hair is dry and just kind of rake it through and shape and, and uh, it, it gives me the smoothness, it gives me hold, but not too much hold, like I can easily run my fingers through my hair, it doesn't feel hairspray-like. Um, and it's just for the time of year that I'm into right now here in the Midwest where the humidity is like below 30% indoors uh, and you've got the, the heated dry air, I'm impressed. This is probably the worst time of year for me to try new hair care products based on where I live and, and living proof uh, is, is proving itself to me. And so I wanted to pass that along. It's on the pricier side. I'm generally not an advocate for uh, expensive hair care, but I'm also a big fan of finding something that works. And to me, investing in something that is unique like this and that really works makes a lot more sense than spending less money on a whole shelf full of products that I'll try one or two times and not really care for or not really see any results. So just relaying my personal experience there. All right, let me turn to my notes as we talk about how to treat dry skin. Um, okay, dry skin is uh, medically referred to as xerosis cutis or xeroderma. And uh, not surprisingly, it's characterized by decreased water content and an impaired barrier function uh, within the stratum corneum, which is the epidermis, the uppermost layers of the epidermis. In many cases of dry skin, a lack of natural moisturizing factor, or NMF, and skin barrier lipids has been shown uh, to occur in that stratum corneum layer. So that essentially means that skin is either not making enough of or not able to hold on to those two vital groups of ingredients that are necessary to keep it smooth, supple, pliable, you know, cho choose your ad adjective or de descriptive word that, that conveys skin that is just, it's, it has a um, really nice tactile sensation. You know, it's not rough, it's not visibly flaky, it isn't itchy, it doesn't feel like it's a size too tight. Um, the natural moisturizing factors that I refer to, that consists of uh, complex to not so complex structures of water-based materials like your amino acids, um, your mucopolysaccharides, your lactates, uh, like ammonium lactate, for example, PCA, you may have seen the skincare ingredient sodium PCA. Those are all part of your skin's natural moisturizing factor. Urea is another ingredient that, that's considered an NMF ingredient, and it's all, I'm going to recommend a product in just a moment that I really want you to try. Um, urea almost deserves its own side discussion, which I'll get to in a second, but the skin barrier lipids, they, const, they constitute what's known as a um, water phobic portion of skin, so the, the natural moisturizing factor, that's your hydration, that's your water loving portion. And then the skin barrier lipids um, are your water trapping, if you will, because the, the natural moisturizing factors help maintain an adequate supply of water in the skin. Uh, and then topically, when you're using a class of ingredients called humectants, those draw and hold moisture to the uppermost layers of skin and help with that nice, dewy, fresh, hydrated look. Um, the barrier lipids are going to be your, your replenishing ingredients. Uh, they typically have more oil-like or emollient qualities. It's going to be your full suite of ceramides, cholesterol, and free fatty acids. Um, there is a ratio of about 10 to 15 percent free fatty acids in the skin, about 25 percent cholesterol, and then anywhere from 40 to 50 percent 
excuse me, is uh, ceramides. So you can instantly see how uh, crucial ceramides are for a healthy barrier and for healthy skin overall. Ceramides are also uh, within the skin as they occur, they are signal um, ingredients. They, they basically tell many other substances in skin what to do and where to go. And so you can imagine if you have a deficiency in ceramides, uh, either due to external or internal causes, not enough of that healthy communication is being sent, which causes other aspects of skin to become disrupted uh, and deficient. So really quick, back to urea. Does not have the most um, enticing sounding name, but in concentrations of around 10%, uh, it is proven to be not just a humectant, uh, that can be very helpful for dry skin, but it also has anti-itch properties. Uh, it also has an influence on um, what is called keratinocyte, which are skin cells, and how they differentiate. There's different schools of thought on this in terms of what causes dry skin, but one of the uh, newer theories is that dry skin, in addition to being about an imbalance of water, natural moisturizing factors, ceramide, uh, either deficiency or loss, um, there is, it also has something to do with how your skin cells move through the various layers of skin, where they go from living cells known as keratinocytes to fully mature or fully differentiated cells. That's what you see on the surface. Those are the dead skin cells that are known as corneocytes. So there seems to be, and there's, there's a, a lot, again, it's the communication network within skin that goes on without us even thinking about it. You know, you don't have to look at your arm and say, you know, make more ceramides. <laughs> if you have normal, healthy skin, that's what it does. Um, it's just fascinating. And, and so, of course, during this differentiation process, there's many steps along the way as that round, plump living cell differentiates layer by layer as it moves to the surface and terminates or dies to become a protective corneocyte. Uh, everything from how, you know, once it gets to the surface, how is it going to adhere? What messages is, are, is it hearing the messages from the lower layers of skin that say, hey, corneocyte, you've been around for long enough, typically 28 to 40 days, you need to, you need to jump ship. We've got other cells that are ready to take your place and those cells are in better condition. So exfoliate corneocyte and we'll do, you know, we'll go about our business. And there's a lot of things that can interrupt that process and lead to a buildup of what that, that is one of the um, visible causes. When you see your skin uh, looks like it has a thickened buildup, it may uh, feel rough, it can look dull or ashen, uh, it may be visibly flaking. Uh, so urea can step in and address all of that. So if you are dealing with chronically dry skin, uh, whether it's on your face or body, <clears throat> look at the various options. <clears throat> There's several online, and honestly, most excuse me, most of them are kind of bland formulas. They're they're really not all that exciting, save for their urea content. Uh, but one I in particular I like, which you can find online and um, in the U.S. Um, Amazon sells it. Several uh, drugstore websites sell it as well. It's from Eucerin. And it's called Dry Skin Intensive 10% Urea Treatment Lotion. It's $27 for an 8-ounce bottle. <clears throat> um, that is on the pricey side for a body lotion, especially from a drugstore line like Eucerin. However, for a product like this, I wouldn't say slather it on from head to toe. This is going to be your secret weapon, so to speak, to pull out when you really want to target in on those very dry, itchy, flaky areas. Um, urea at, in 10%, again, I, I find, I think if you haven't used it before, you're going to find that it's very effective. However, it is not the most cosmetically elegant feeling ingredient. So again, I don't think any, most people are going to want to put a 10% and some brands make 20%. That concentration of urea from head to toe isn't going to feel too good in most formulas. But for those spot areas where you have that problem dry skin, whether it's hands, chest, feet, patches on the face, I think it's absolutely worth a try. And not surprisingly, that product is fragrance free. Um, the majority of people worldwide will experience dry skin at some stage in their lives due to the loss of lipids in skin. Not surprisingly, because our skin becomes less efficient 
at maintaining those lipids, making those lipids, and holding on to those lipids as we age, dry skin is exceedingly common, particularly on the body, once um, people reach the age of 60 or older. Now, there are going to be outliers, as there are in any group. Um, you can absolutely be in your 60s and 70s and still be breaking out on your face or body, or maybe you're having breakouts from the chest up, but everywhere else is super dry. That can happen as well. So the dry skin can either be what's called acute, uh, uh, which is uh, rather intense but temporary, or it can be chronic, meaning it's just ongoing. It's, and that, generally speaking, somebody who has naturally dry skin, meaning that they were, they were born this way, and there, there could be many things that are impacting the dry skin internally, uh, and then, of course, just living in a rather harsh external environment can, can exacerbate those. So, But that is a person that's basically going to have dry skin from cradle to grave, as they say. Somebody with chronic dry skin is most likely experiencing it due to uh, atopic or irritant contact dermatitis. For example, exposure to chemicals uh, without protective gloves on, maybe in a workplace environment. Uh, it can be seasonal, uh, ex exposure to extreme cold or extreme heat. Uh, any of those things can cause <clears throat> more of an, an acute bout of dry skin. Some external causes that you absolutely have uh, control over uh, to curb dry skin is taking long hot showers or baths, using harsh, more alkaline cleansers such as traditional bar soaps or deodorant, body bars, those tend to be very harsh and also very strongly fragranced, uh, and soaps and bar cleansers in general also tend to have a very difficult time rinsing from skin. I always notice that whenever I stay, uh, I stayed in a, a hotel recently, the family got away for the weekend, and <clears throat> the only cleansing option that the room provided was a small bar of standard soap. I don't even know what brand it was or if I even paid attention, but of course I washed my hands with it because there was nothing else there, and I immediately noticed how difficult it was to get that soap off my hands. You know, if you go from like washing with a water soluble hand cleanser to moving to back to a bar soap, it's the, the difference is obvious. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is what happens when you're using a bar to a bar soap from, from the neck down. You're, you're getting this residue that is very difficult to wash off and that can absolutely worsen dull, dry, flaky skin. So cut that out. Um, I mentioned occupational factors like dealing with contact irritants, chemicals used, uh, uh, for example, in a salon setting, uh, or even um, in, a, in a, uh, doing household chores. You know, you're cleaning your bathroom or washing your dishes. Um, you know, what else? What else would involve um, washing the floor, for example? Wear gloves. If you have dry skin and arms, particularly if you have uh, eczema, wear gloves whenever you're doing chores like that. Because even if you are using super gentle household cleansers, you know, maybe even a DIY type cleanser, in almost any situation like that, you are also exposing your hands to frequent contact with water. And water, for as refreshing as it is and as necessary as it is for our health, Externally, you know, we have to remember that water is a solvent and it can prolong contact with water, uh, can cause those uh, damage to skin's barrier and cause those vital replenishing lipids to become depleted. So you got to keep that in mind as well. Some uh, internal causes or endogenous of dry skin include various skin diseases, inflammatory skin conditions. I mentioned atopic dermatitis. There's also allergic contact dermatitis. For example, someone who's allergic to nickel, someone who's allergic to wool or perhaps a perfume in a laundry detergent. There's irritant contact uh, dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, psoriasis is another skin disease that is characterized by um, thickened patches of dry skin. All of those, um, those are not problems that can be easily solved via skincare. They almost always require medical attention. So if you feel like you are struggling with any of those, or if you have uh, persistent dry skin that really isn't responding well to any skincare steps or products that you use, 
talk to your doctor because chances are you need something more potent to get that under control. There's also um, various infectious diseases that impact the skin, can cause dryness, certain bacterial and fungal infections, uh, scabies infections, which uh, if you've ever had scabies, and I hope none of you have, it's miserable. Uh, I have not had it, but I've known people that have, and, and they would not wish it on their worst enemy. Um, there's also internal and systemic uh, issues like uh, certain endocrine disorders, uh, di di diabetes, hypothyroidism, uh, which is underactive, and then hyperthyroidism, which is overactive. Uh, those thyroid issues can be determined by a blood test to, that your doctor can order to check your thyroid hormone. Various uh, inflammatory diseases in the body, like Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, certain infections uh, such as HIV, hepatitis B and C, pregnancy, menopause. These are all conditions that you may not be aware of that can either cause or contribute to dry skin. Um, and I, my job is to arm you with the best information and to really help you troubleshoot. Um, so going down that rabbit hole just a little further, there's also um, some mental health uh, issues that can contribute or cause dry skin, such as various eating disorders, such as anorexia, uh, where you are denying yourself uh, the nutrients that your skin needs to be healthy, and you're, and you're doing that on a long-term basis. Um, alcohol abuse can contribute to dry skin, and, and so can uh, various drug addictions. Uh, because typically when people get involved in that type of thing, that the last thing they're thinking about is, is taking care of their skin. Um, dietary, such as not getting a good balance of proteins, fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals from, from whole fresh food. Um, it's been proven in studies that people who eat a large amount of highly processed or high sodium type food and very little uh, fresh whole foods uh, the, you can literally look at their skin and their skin does not look healthy, especially when put next to someone of the same age, same skin color, uh, who eats a more balanced diet. And I'm not saying don't ever have a cheeseburger from McDonald's or chicken McNuggets or, or whatever. I mean, indulge in those, but do that sparingly if that's your jam. Um, lastly, uh, you need to keep in mind that there are many prescription medications. This is a more detailed conversation to have with your pharmacist or physician, but diuretics, beta blockers, contraceptives, uh, prescription retinoids, long-term use of topical steroids, cholesterol-lowering drugs, and of course, <clears throat> and not surprisingly, like the various types of radiation therapy uh, we, we undergo when we have certain types of cancers. Those can all contribute to dry skin. So that's kind of a big overview of the causes of dry skin. Um, what, about, what about dry skin and acne? What do you do then? Unfortunately, and some of you know I'm going to say this, <clears throat> there isn't a, a one-size-fits-all solution. If, <clears throat> if your dry skin and breakouts are limited to your face, my best suggestion is to go ahead and use the conventional uh, research proven over-the-counter actives for getting your acne under control. So a leave-on exfoliant medicated with uh, at least 2% salicylic acid, also known as beta-hydroxy acid, and a topical disinfectant that contains benzoyl peroxide. The Paula's Choice Clear Line, we have uh, those types of ingredients available over the counter for acne in uh, a regular strength and extra strength versions. So if you do have drier skin, I don't blame you for wanting to start with the regular strength version uh, and then see how, your, see how your skin responds. I also really uh, like azelaic acid for dealing with breakouts and dry skin at the same time. It is not on the uh, acne monograph, but azelaic acid has a pretty profound soothing effect on skin. Uh, so it can help deal with the redness that often accompanies acne, uh, and it can also help deal with the um, post-breakout marks, those discolorations that are left behind. And for dry skin, azelaic acid has some really nice brightening properties, as does vitamin C. Now, in terms of um, moisturizers and serums and other treatment-type products, 
my best advice is to use the lightest texture that you can get away with. Try to steer clear of creams, ointments, balms, anything that has um, uh, oil or a wax or, or, thicken, or heavier thickening type agents like polyisobutene, for example. If you see those among the first few ingredients, I would not put those on. Even though they can be great for dry skin, I wouldn't put them on your skin if you've got dry skin and acne at the same time. The other thing that uh, I would definitely suggest is talking to your doctor <clears throat> about using a prescription retinoid, but tell them that you need one that's in a cream base. Uh, and that may be uh, just simply asking for Renova from Johnson & Johnson, uh, because that, last I knew at least, <laughs> that was still available in a fairly emollient base. And retinoid in prescription form uh, definitely has documented evidence backing up its uh, merit for dealing with acne. Uh, it just, it's a pretty marvelous, uh, and there's of course, um, if you have very, very bad cystic type acne, you can always have the conversation with your dermatologist about oral vitamin A isotretinoin and doing a short term, potentially lower dose course of that and seeing how your acne does. That will, and your doctor should explain this to you in detail, that will make your skin very dry. And so in that particular situation, you may want to break the rule I just told you about and, and use some of those heavier duty emollients to get you through that period. Um, and I only say that because for a lot of people that take isotretinoin, it's so effective on the acne that even if you use something that would normally make you break out, that won't happen while you're taking the isotretinoin. So it's kind of a, I guess you could say a bit of a grace period where you can get away with doing something like that. What about how to deal with flaky skin? Um, the general advice is to always deal, unless the flaky skin is caused by the use of a leave-on exfoliant, AHA, BHA, or even PHA, my general advice is to start dealing with flaky skin by using a good, gentle leave-on exfoliant, uh, followed by a moisturizer that is suitable for your skin type. Uh, alpha hydroxy acids, one of the, like glycolic acid, lactic acid, those are the two big ones. One of the reasons that we um, steer people with dry skin toward the AHAs over BHA, salicylic acid, is because AHAs uh, are like, particularly lactic acid. Like lactic acid is part of your skin's natural moisturizing factor. Uh, it also plays a key role in maintaining the health of your skin's microbiome. But separate from that, uh, the AHAs have been shown to help stimulate uh, your skin to make more and to make better ceramides. So that's pretty cool. BHA has some hydrating abilities as well. Uh, the problem is that most BHA exfoliants are in a base formula that is inherently drying. Um, for example, denatured alcohol is the primary ingredient along with some water, and then you've got your salicylic acid, your ingredient to hold the salicylic acid in the correct pH, maybe some fragrance, and maybe a soothing agent if you're lucky. But that soothing agent is going to be fighting a lost cause because of all the irritation that a high volume of denatured alcohol uh, can cause. So that is a huge reason why none of the Paul's Choice BHA exfoliants contain that type of alcohol. We use uh, gentler, more humectant type solvents um, like we do in our 2% BHA liquid, as well as the clear extra strength anti-redness exfoliating solution. So do that. If your dry skin um, it, or the, if the flaky, if the dry flaky skin is on your your feet, for example, one of the things that I love doing is taking a product like Carousel ointment, which you can get in most drugstores. That is uh, an anhydrous or water-free salicylic acid ointment that uh, does a great job at getting rid of that buildup of flaky skin. So you could slather your feet in that. Don a pair of uh, comfortable cotton socks. Do not walk around with Carousel on the bottom of your feet. You will slip and fall, and <laughs> I don't want that to happen, but yes, it's slippery, yes, it's greasy, which is why you need to wear those socks, but the next morning, you should see a, a considerable difference. And then, because you don't want to put that thick, kind of goopy stuff on your feet every night, but you do still want to pay attention if you are prone to dry, flaky skin on the feet. <clears throat> so, that typically means 
using a more buttery emollient type product on a fairly regular basis, uh, at least till you get to a point where you're, you know, you you feel like you're maintaining the results. You can go a couple days without using it, and your skin isn't dry and flaky the way it used to be. Now, for me, I like using our ultra rich smoothing body butter because it's just just luxuriously thick and it spreads well. Uh, and it's emollient without being super greasy, like a like a um, Vaseline type greasiness. It doesn't get anywhere near that. Um, and my feet are baby but smooth the next morning. So I, I use that quite a bit, actually. In fact, I'm squeezing the last bit out of a tube right now. Well, not right now, but you know what I mean. Um, another option um, is there are um, a couple of eczema repair creams that the Eucerin brand makes that are fragrance-free. Um, and they're generally available in most drugstores. The get the get the cream in the bigger size, the, the in larger size tube. Don't get the specially special one because I'm fairly certain it's a much smaller size, costs more per ounce, and I'm fairly certain because I've compared the two on my own skin, they feel identical. They feel identical. So why not get the bigger size for the body, uh, and not the smaller one that they sell for the face and save yourself some money. I will say though that texture-wise, in comparison to a product like our beautiful, our used to be called beautiful body butter, our ultra-rich smoothing body butter, that the Eucerin eczema repair creams, um, for everything that I love about them, they do have a greasier feel. Um, so for that reason, I don't like using them on my hands unless I'm not going to be using my hands for a while. Um, and I have been known in the past to, if you have dry, flaky skin on the hands, do the same thing you would for your feet. Um, you could try the salicylic acid. You could also try um, the urea type product that I mentioned earlier or another product with a high amount of urea and then go to sleep wearing cotton gloves. That can help a lot. Another huge help if you have just general bouts of dry skin that you, particularly if it's tied to seasonal changes, is to run a humidifier in your home. Preferably several, depending on the size of your home. But if you're thinking, you know, I only just want to deal with one of those, you know, where is it going to have the most impact? Think about the room in the house where most of us spend the most time, uh, and chances are uh, it's going to be the bedroom because, you know, we spend a third of our lives in bed trying, sleeping or at least trying to sleep. So that's what, that's what we do. I have a humidifier up in my son's bedroom. I have a humidifier in our bedroom. I try not to trip over the cord when I get up in the middle of the night. I'm not always successful with that. Um, and it's quite hilarious, but, <laughs> but yes, that, that can be a very easy way to, um, improve your, improve your dry skin even further and also help improve you're breathing, you know, because when we're in a low humidity environment, uh, we also get, it, we're much more prone to the nostrils becoming dried out. And that can lead to uh, all kinds of issues, including a bloody nose, uh, which nobody wants to have to deal with, right? So how to figure out if your skin is just dry or chronically dehydrated? Generally, I like to think of it in terms of... <clears throat> Having truly dry skin is about a lack of oil. That's an oversimplification for the explanation of the loss of the lipids and the natural moisturizing factor and everything we've been discussing to date. But simply put, dry skin is about a lack of oil. Dehydrated skin, on the other hand, is about a lack of water. Either a lack of water or uh, an, a deficiency in skin's ability to hold on to enough water to keep itself from feeling dehydrated. And generally, <clears throat> when skin is in a state that it is unable to hold on to enough water, but it's still producing uh, either a normal or uh, an excess amount of oil, it is absolutely possible to have what a lot of people describe as dry underneath and oily on top. They see the oil, they see the areas where their pores have enlarged to accommodate the extra oil, and, but underneath that layer of oil, their skin looks and or feels dehydrated. Uh, and that more than likely also has to do with having, because you, you'd think, why isn't your skin's oil, especially if you have an excess amount of it, why isn't that holding onto the water? I mean, you'd think it would kind of trap it, right? You know, because water 
water and oil don't mix. You know, you need something in a cosmetic, you need something called an emulsifier uh, ingredient, like a polysorbate, for example, to keep those ingredients blended and to keep them from separating. So I haven't verified this 100% in the research, but from what I've read, my theory is that when somebody has <clears throat> extra oily skin and they're still dealing with dehydration, and they look at the products they're using and they can accurately conclude that the products I'm using are either completely unlikely or really, really low chance of leading to this dehydration, right? I have my, my working theory is that the composition of the fatty acids in your oil and your skin sebum is somehow out of whack. And, and it happens and it's not there's nothing to be ashamed or embarrassed about it can happen it can happen for various dietary reasons it can happen for various genetic reasons uh, you could be dealing with uh, certain skin issues uh, that, that can impact that um, I I like using um, salicylic acid and niacinamide together because they seem to have a positive ability to help uh, change that poorer quality oil back to where it should be in terms of the ratio of fatty acids. So if you haven't explored those two ingredients and leave on products uh, and you want to look for about minimum three to five percent niacinamide, you can certainly use more uh, if you have additional concerns that warrant going to a higher concentration. But I think those two ingredients are probably my, my favorite unsung heroes for dealing with skin that is dry underneath and oily on top, where there's a dehydration issue going on. Because uh, again, vi vitamins, or not vitamin C, niacinamide has some wonderful properties when it comes to helping skin's barrier become better. When you have a better, stronger, more intact barrier, your skin will be much less likely to lose water uh, and become dehydrated and will become much better at being able to distribute that water within the uppermost layers of skin, help it get to where it needs to go. Your skin actually has um, aquaporins, which are water channels. You know, there's like this little, you know, network of rivers, if you want to think of it that way, uh, where the balanced amount of water needs to go to maintain hydration. Ironically, a lot of people think dry skin and just having dry skin is about a lack of water, uh, and it isn't, surprisingly. Um, the water content of, uh, the, in the uppermost layers, the water content of dry skin and somebody who has oily skin is fairly close. There isn't, there isn't a, hu a huge difference in that water content. It's really more about someone with intrinsically dry skin having an inability to hold on to enough water uh, or the, the skin doesn't have the complete instructions, if you will, on where to distribute that water so that skin feels balanced and hydrated. Um, I think that covered everything on the list. Let's go ahead and start answering some questions here. So we've got about 20 minutes left. I'm surprisingly enjoying wearing these glasses without a nose piece. Miss Flory W. Hi, Brian. Shall we avoid spraying perfume on our skin, but spray it on our clothes instead? Thanks. Generally, yes. Um, you know, fragrance in any form is not ideal for skin. Um, I look at some of the areas where people tend to apply fragrance behind the ears, you know, on our pulse points, behind the knees. And guess what? Those areas are naturally prone to dryness and eczema type conditions, you know, generally speaking, if you know, because a lot of us are prone to that. And so when you're putting fragrance, whether it's an eau de toilette, a cologne, a parfum, when you're putting fragrance directly on those areas, you're just tempting fate in terms of making those conditions worse. So I'm a big fan of um, what I what I will sometimes do is a few spritzes of, of a cologne in the air and then I kind of walk back and forth through it when I'm dressed uh, to let it fall on my clothes and I'll also sometimes spray my hair. Hair is a good transmitter of scent. Those of you who are old enough to remember what it was like to go to restaurants and bars when people could still smoke inside and many people did so, 
you know, what happened, you, you, if you're not a smoker, you get back into your car or get to your house and be like, you, you'd reek, you'd smell of smoke. Um, you know, and, and a lot of, especially uh, people who had longer hair, you know, you could almost, yep, I smell it right in my hair. Um, so you can absolutely put fragrance in your hair. Don't spray it directly on your scalp because you, that could lead to an itchy, irritated scalp. But putting fragrance on the hair is totally fine. Your hair is, it's, you're not going to hurt it uh, and it's not going to hurt your skin. So that would be my best advice. Um, if you, you know, must put it on your skin, I would absolutely pay attention to how your skin responds. Notice the areas where you're spraying. Are they developing any bumps? Are they are they getting red? Uh, are you seeing uh, an ashen, you know, patchy, patchy, uh, scaly area developing? Or is the skin itching? You know, those are all telltale signs that you should not be putting fragrance on your skin. Uh, and not everyone's going to experience that. So if you are using a fragrance that you just love and, you know, you're applying it sparingly and some of it gets on your skin, I'm not going to chastise you for that, but I, I do want you to be aware of what to look out for because um, you'd be surprised how many people don't make that association. They think that this patch of irritation or itchiness on their skin is due to anything but that, uh, and particularly if it's a fragrance that they've been using for a long time and they can look back and say, well, it's never bothered me before, so it must be something else. Skin does have a threshold, particularly for allergic type reactions, and if you past that threshold, which can take a while, years, to happen, you know, all of a sudden you can be allergic to or irritated by something that never used to bother you, at least not visibly so, in the past. Caleb said, what's your take on ceramides? Does this uh, SK Influx blend that many brands use in their products benefit skin? Do ceramides, fatty acids, cholesterol, and a product need to be in a certain ratio? That, if you're... That's kind of a yes and no question because it depends on what else is going to be in the formula with it. You know, you see the various ratios bandied about in terms of the, I think it's usually a, a 3 one, 1 type ratio where it's three part ceramide to one part cholesterol to one part free fatty acids, which pretty much matches what the natural um, lipid blend in skin is. Um, we do know absolutely that whether they're in that ratio or uh, in some other type of a gentle emollient uh, replenishing base, that skin uh, ceramides are skin identical ingredients. When you put them on your skin, your skin recognizes them and knows what to do with them. Um, I could see the merit if you have chronically dry skin uh, of trying one of those 311 type products and seeing how your skin responds. But there are other ingredients like niacinamide, sunflower seed oil, in fact, many non fragrant plant oils, um, um, linoleic acid, linolenic acid, the omega fatty acids, all of those can be incredibly beneficial when you have dry skin, even in the absence of ceramides. So, as much as I like ceramides as a group of ingredients, um, I don't think they're the be-all, end-all in terms of what you absolutely must look for on the label when you have dry skin. I think there's a whole wide range of ingredients that can help uh, alleviate dry skin via numerous pathways, and there's lots of studies backing that up. Um, so, again, I'm not, I wouldn't put ceramides on some pedestal above several other ingredients, but they absolutely can do amazing things for skin, and they're certainly... Yeah, I, I, it's never a detriment when you see ceramides in a product, assuming the product is otherwise well formulated. Uh, Katie asks if I can touch on acne and dry skin, how to hydrate without causing breakouts. That was discussed. Uh, Katie, I could add to that that there are some other use thinner, lightweight, hydrating products at every step of your routine. Use a use a moisturizing but non uh, cold cream thick type cleanser use a replenishing toner, use a hydrating serum. You know, those are all products with thinner textures that have those nice, lightweight, not likely to clog pores or make acne worse type ingredients. And yes, it may mean that you need to use more products to get to where the level of moisture your dry skin needs. So rather than just using one rich moisturizer that you got to scoop out, it's so thick, it's like pudding, you'd use three products as different steps in your skincare routine all of which have thinner textures. 
Edna Ramos, hey Brian, I was given a topical steroid for eczema on my feet. While that has helped, what can I do about the peeling skin without further irritation? Thanks so much. So we talked about how to deal with flaky dry skin on the feet. If the flakiness is a side effect of the topical steroid, if, if, you've, if you're think, if so if your experience was, I did not have flaky skin on my feet before I started using the steroid, and then the flakiness showed up. That's a conversation to have with your doctor, uh, whomever prescribed it for you, and or a pharmacist, and ask what else you could use uh, in place of that to get you the same or a similar result. Um, if if you are if you are prescribed that product for short-term use, which is generally the case, um, and it's causing some flaking, but otherwise you're seeing an improvement in whatever it was that your steroid cream was prescribed for. If it were me, I'd stick it out and just do the course of the steroid, moisturize the heck out of my feet uh, to help minimize that flaky appearance and feeling, um, and then pay attention to how your foot or your feet do when you discontinue use of the topical steroid. <clears throat> Tammy says, praise be, I need this chat. I hope you found it helpful, Tammy. Thanks for joining. Um... Caleb, thank you for the compliment. Actually, it's funny you mentioned Oribe. That's my other favorite hair care line. Um, I just wish it wasn't so dang expensive. And I do, I, I cannot bring myself to spend the money on Oribe shampoos. I, I just can't. My husband did once, uh, and he bought their shampoo for beautiful color. And I actually found that way too rich for my hair. Uh, and he didn't notice any difference in terms of color preservation. Not surprisingly, it is very difficult to get color to stick around, and a shampoo is probably, well, it, not probably, it isn't what you should be using to try to get the color to last longer. It, it's better to do that with conditioners and leave-in products uh, because those are much more apt to deposit, for example, UV filters on the hair or other types of ingredients that can help hair, dyed hair, withstand the color changes that occur due to environmental exposure. A little aside there. Alex says, Hi Brian, I have dry skin and love to use the recovery mask from our skin recovery line as a nighttime moisturizer. A lot of people do that. No reason not to. I'm currently taking prescription retinol and was wondering if this product is non-comedogenic. Good question. You may have noticed, particularly if you've been with Paula's Choice for, for uh, a year or so, or you know, a time or two, that we don't make the non-comedogenic claim. Uh, the reason for that is because we still kind of regard that as, as a bogus type claim because, not that it isn't made by other brands with good intentions, don't get me wrong, there's still, to this day, just like for hypoallergenic, just like for non-acnegenic, which is kind of an offshoot of non-comedogenic, there are no standards uh, to which those 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 terms are, are are regulated or governed. So anybody, you know, you could you could have the thickest, most emollient, greasy moisturizer out there, and a company could say non-comedogenic. They don't have to prove it, and and there's nothing saying that they can't do that or what exactly defines non-comedogenic from an ingredient or formulary perspective. Um, so. My advice in that regard, and then this is why we haven't made non-comedogenic claims, because separate from everything I just said, how many of us who are prone to breakouts or clogged pores have used products that, ha that are sold with that claim, and yet we still broke out, or the products made our breakouts worse? So we always want to, uh, for lack of a better description, under-promise and over-deliver, you know, we try to be very, very careful about only, you know, making claims that we know are supported by research, that are supported by uh, what the ingredients have proven to do for skin over a period of time. And so I, I can't say with 100% certainty or honesty that the skin recovery mask, because that does have some emollients and some oils in it and whatnot, that it's just not going to clog your pores. You have to try it and see how your skin responds. That's that's the bottom line. Uh, and that's why ultimately the non-comedogenic claim, despite its helpful intent, is ultimately meaningless. Because until we have a set of rules defining you know, what counts as comedogenic 
and what counts as non-comedogenic. And first of all, we'll never figure that out because there's the vagaries of different ingredients and concentrations and blends. And what about the fact that, you know, most people who are following a skincare routine use more than one product? You know, so maybe it's not one ingredient in one product that's comedogenic. It's the combination uh, of everything you're using. And then what about all those ingredients mixing with your skin's own oil? Is that what's causing the comedogenicity? You know, is it so is it fair to label the product as being the poor? I mean, it's just it makes your head hurt the more you think about it. But it's that's a that's why that's why we're not relying on that on that term. Uh, and, and I wouldn't say, yes, that mask is non-comedogenic. I couldn't not, I mean, cause my, I want to be honest, uh, and tell you what I know to be true. And I can't say with hundred percent certainty, that won't be a problem. You got to try it. Gelato said, or Galato says, thank you so much for doing the chats, Brian. It really helps me. Thank you. Glad to hear it. Could the resist 2% salicylic acid cause purging? Potentially, yes. We have an article on the uh, uh, expert advice section of our site, or if you just go to the homepage of paulischoice.com and do a search for purging, you can read all about what we had to say about that, why it happens, why it happens for some people and not others, and how to get yourself through it. So check that out for sure. Uh, Andrea says, hi, Brian. Just wanted to say how much I love the PC peptide lip balm. So great on winter chapped lips. <gasps> Yay! I love that. You mean that you must be referring to the lip booster. Um, yeah, that's very, very happy with that formula. Um, that I'm also even happier that that particular formula was 100% developed in our very own lab. Uh, and then of course we, we align with different manufacturers that do what's called scale up for us because our lab does not have the capacity to make 25,000 pieces of something. Um, but we can certainly do smaller batches and we can do a lot of trial and error in the lab. And um, we have we have three um, really in just innovative and very, very smart chemists working for us, uh, as well as our innovation director, who is also a seasoned chemist. So it's a very, very exciting time uh, to be on the Paul's Choice team. I'm, I'm geeking out a little bit over my coworkers because... I love having this this collaboration with them um, and, and just having that direct line where we can talk about formulary technologies, ingredients, ingredient combinations, and, and that's kind of how the whole concept of this lip booster came about was because we're like, how do we incorporate multiple lip enhancing technologies, um, you know, and after vetting several of them that we ended up rejecting because they worked, but they worked by virtue of irritation. Uh, they, they would, for example, plump lips by causing lower, lower level inflammation. And we know that's not healthy for skin or lips long term. You know, if you want to occasionally put on a lip plumper that has, for example, a red pepper extract in it or a really potent form of menthol, uh, and it's going to make your lips swell for a few hours, okay. You know, if, they, if this is like for a New Year's Eve party, or a class reunion type thing, and you're kind of a one and done with it, I'm more worried about you using that type of product on a daily basis and what it could do for the long-term health and appearance of your lips. All right, Mia Bell, what is the best way to repair the skin barrier? And can I put retinol on my skin if my skin barrier is broken? Retinol, retinol, uh, that's a tricky question. Again, because just like the ceramide ratio question that I, I answered earlier, it so much depends on the formula and the amount of retinol. So I, generally speaking, I would, I would recommend getting that barrier repaired first and then working into retinol. The irritation some people experience from retinol, um, in most cases, it has to do with enzymes in our skin, and this differs from person to person, not breaking down the retinoic acid as efficiently or as quickly as it should. Because that, that retinoic acid is the active form of vitamin A. So when you put retinol on your skin, it attaches to the receptor sites, uh, the RAR sites on cells, and it goes through a conversion process um, that releases, that converts the retinol to retinoic acid, which is the active form that the skin can use. Um, 
and they're either during that conversion process or after as the retinoic acid is, is being utilized and then eventually broken down. If it takes too long for that conversion to happen or for the eventual breakdown to happen, you can get an irritant response, uh, what some dermatologists have called retinol dermatitis. Um, there's some interesting formulary and, and ingredient technologies being looked at that could potentially or actually minimize or bypass that, which is really exciting because what it means is greater tolerability for retinol. And uh, I, I am a huge fan of retinol. It does wonderful things for skin. I use it myself. Uh, but I've also had my share of difficulties with it over the years. Um, and I finally got to a point where I have a strength of it uh, and, a, and, a, and in, in a formula that my skin does really well with. I know it's thriving. That's Personally, it's our clinical 0.3% retinol, 2% Bacuchiol treatment um, that I think I'm on my fifth or sixth bottle of by now. It's a nightly staple for me. Um, so, best way to repair the skin barrier, take an internal and an external approach. I think that there's absolutely... Um, merit and good research to support uh, considering a dietary supplement such as the one that we offer. There are others out there, but the ingredients in ours, like your, your hyaluronic acid, your antioxidant blend, and particularly the glucosal ceramides, which are in our, in our supplement, they're derived from rice bran. So it is a food grade food source. Um, those can really make it, you may need to take it for at least a month before you start noticing a visible difference. Uh, but try that alongside a skincare routine that focuses on those barrier replenishing, barrier restoring ingredients. Ingredients like, of course, the ceramides, the cholesterol, the various fatty acids, including the omegas. Squalane is a good ingredient to look for. Shea butter, um, any of those really soothing type antioxidants, your, your teas like the green tea, curcuminoids are amazing, pomegranate is a good one, um, niacinamide definitely plays a role in helping to improve skin's barrier because it can coach skin on how to make better ceramides. Uh, ditto for linoleic acid, which is the precursor for all ceramides. You could also look for phytosphingosine as another ingredient. There's just there's a lot of glycerin, hyaluronic acid, sodium hyaluronic. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, so make sure that you're using a varied mix of those ingredients in your routine. Avoid any drying, irritating, and particularly over-fragranced products. And that can go a long way towards really bringing your barrier back to a healthier, um, repaired state. Couple more questions here. Ah, uh, let's see. Haha. <laughs> Tammy says, PC product info I provided is too long. TerraCycle loves to see me coming. Kind of feels like I own stock in PC. Oh. <laughs> uh, Jean Michael says, Hi, hey Brian, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Could you mention foods that can be consumed daily that are beneficial for skin? How can extracts from these foods and skincare benefit skin? Basically, I mean, I'm not, <clears throat> I don't necessarily have the inside track on that, Jean Michael. Um, in terms of exactly how they do that, my understanding is that as those, as the nutrients in those foods are broken down by the digestive process, they get into the bloodstream and they can go to uh, areas where they need to do, where they, where, where they are needed, essentially. Um, for example, think of what happens when uh, if someone has an eating disorder such as anorexia, where they're not getting, uh, they're getting little to no nutrition and then how that impacts how their skin looks. Uh, or think of just being nutrient deficient in some way and how that can impact the skin. Um, it's through the bloodstream, as I understand it, that those nutrients travel. And there isn't, it really is about, in terms of what you're eating, it really is about a balance. So brightly colored, fresh fruits and vegetables eaten on the regular, um, healthy whole grains, not refined grains or flour, for example, can definitely help because those are rich sources of antioxidants and B vitamins, which are critical for healthy skin. Um, lean proteins, fattier fish like uh, salmon, tuna, mackerel, uh, if you like halibut. Um, what else? What else? What else? Uh, you, I mean, the pr proteins are essential. Skin is composed primarily. The skin cells are the keratinocytes. They're, they're, it's protein. But you just want to make sure that you're eating 
leaner sources of protein um, and making sure that you're not getting too much saturated fat. Um, that's the general advice. And if you don't think you're getting enough of those nutrients on a regular basis to improve your dry skin, you can certainly talk to your healthcare provider about supplement type recommendations. Um, I do a collagen supplement powder form. I take uh, krill oil, which is from very tiny shrimp-like crustaceans. It's a great source of omega-3 fatty acids, which I know I don't get enough of in my diet. Um, I've recently started taking resveratrol uh, for its potent anti antioxidant capabilities. So there's lots of options there. You kind of just need to do your homework. And in terms of diet, the general advice is the more healthy, whole, fresh type foods you consume on a regular basis, the healthier your skin will be now and long term. And you should see an improvement uh, in dryness. Um, but most people with inherently dry skin, they are going to need to take a multi-pronged approach. It's not just about a healthy diet or a healthy lifestyle. It's also about the skincare products you use. You can't neglect topical care when you have dry skin. It is a package deal because you could have, you know, by anyone's definition, the healthiest diet you could possibly eat and still have dry skin. Now, if you weren't eating well, your dry skin would likely be in much worse shape. But the fact of the matter is diet alone uh, cannot get rid of dry skin. So on that note, I'm a little bit over time, but I thank you guys so much for your questions and for joining me today. I'm Brian Barron, the Director of Skin Care Research at Paula's Choice Skin Care, and I will be back with two more live chats next month. All new topics.